Welcome to Forging Plowshares, a community dedicated to cultivating the peaceful kingdom of God. We hope this part of our ongoing conversation stimulates your mind and challenges your heart about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Please stay tuned at the end of the podcast for a short message about our ministry. In this conclusion to class two, Jordan continues to talk about personhood, but he also answers a series of questions then connected not only to personhood, but to God's foreknowledge and elaborates then on one of the most unique and insightful understandings into how God foreknows and what that foreknowledge consists of and how it then is fulfilled in the person and work of Christ. If you are enjoying these podcasts, we hope you'll subscribe, like us on social media, and consider supporting Forging Plowshares. You can support us through Patreon or through Outreach International. You can see how to do that on our website. We are a donation-based ministry dependent upon the goodwill of those who may be enjoying the work that we're doing. We are offering a class on Rene Girard by Michael Harden. We're very excited that Michael has agreed to do this class. He is one of the leading experts on Girard in this country. He knew Girard back in the 1980s. He was there when Gerard first appeared on the scene and has been one of his most consistent supporters and promoters. We'll have that class in October and November. But hope you enjoy then this final podcast on class two on the whole mystery of Christ with Jordan Wood. Thank you. Um, And also, yes, the conversation is amazing. Um, I did actually have one question in the, uh, I guess the one I sent in the text was just that, I guess somewhat in the question of univocity or equivocity or how words are used, like, could you say that things are natural to hypotheses that aren't natural to natures so that you could say Mm. that human nature couldn't naturally be become the divine nature, but a human person does naturally become supernatural because a person is not just their nature. Yes. Yeah. So what I would want to say is that, that being a person already means you're beyond whatever nature you are. I don't know if that gets at it, but it, it, so so I, I think the language of natural to hypotheses might be a little. I, I get what you're. I see what you're driving at, right? It's um, you know part of this is is the actual historical text. Like I, the use of nature is just so delineated in its logic from person by necessity from Chalcedon that to say, for example, a person has natural content of any kind, so that something is natural to a person that might not be natural to uh, well, you got two options there. What that means, one is that it's an accident, and that would be a common way that Platonic, you know, you know, uh, Porphyrian tradition would take it. So, like Solomon having brown hair is, it's in a sense, it's specific to you. It's that hair. It is. It's true of you, not of human nature. Abstractly, I thought that's. But you also it can, you know, it could come and go, and you yourself wouldn't change. So much of the problem is that the history of metaphysics basically is a logic of essence versus accident. And then the various ways to configure that. But the who is deeper than either of those because the who actually bears both. I both am human and can never lose that, but also I can lose my hair. So I I bear both accidents and the essential predicates or or, uh, properties of my nature. But then I'm not simply identical in, in terms of logic. I'm not identical to either of those. The other option besides an accidental property would be something like a hypostatic property. Um, you know, for example, in the, tr- the Trinitarian discourses, they're going to do that, right? He who is originated from the, the, the uh, father is the son. And that's the filiation is who he is. So his hypostatic property is who he is. Now, I like that, but it still means in Christology that the filiation from the father is the exact personal identity of Jesus of Nazareth. The only other option I can think of would be if something is natural to a, to a hypothesis, it means that it, it's its own kind, the way that, say, Thomas conceives of angels. There's only one member of every species an angel, right? Because it is it's a, every single angel is its own kind. So in a sense, that they're the hypostatic and the natural or could make the same property. Look, here's another way to put it. Maybe I should have started with this. Nature, part of the problem as well is that nature has two senses from like its etymological origins. Nature is that which is already there and present at the origin or birth, natus, 
of something. That's like a very phenomenological definition. It's also why nature often has this uh, implication of organic growth, right? Because it's like everything that's already there that will power whatever you develop into, that's in your nature. And that's colloquial today. We say, it's just not in my nature to care about the football game, whatever, right? It's like, it just wasn't there when I was born. So anything that's present at your birth is in a sense natural in that broadly phenomenological sense. But then the, the problem is um, when you do like metaphysics and you start doing logic and even just grammar, right? Parsing the, sub, uh, the, the grammar of a sentence, you have to come to, to, uh, to say things like, well, but what something is and how it develops is the kind of thing it is. Now you've made it in an essence. So it's no longer just everything that was there at birth at the natus is your nature, but also how it is like the logic or intelligibility or the powers that are there in order to fulfill for you to become truly who or what you are is usually what they're saying. A full human being, like Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics, what is a full human life? What is a perfected human life? That is an essence, essential power, potential. And what I do think sometimes happens in these discussions as well is those get conflated. So what is already there at your birth is just your essence. Whereas I think you could just as easily say the opposite. Whatever is at your there at your birth, precisely because you're a person, is already beyond your essence. Yeah. So no, I think that's yeah. helpful. I, um, it almost actually goes back to, um, what section is it? Uh, it's at point eight, I think. Yeah, 60.8. Where Maximus talks about um, only God being able to know God's own essence, and right. humans don't because they can't foreknow the future, and but that it will be revealed by God in the end what their what our true essence is, and I suppose if along that line, and even kind of thinking of some of Maximus's other discussions of uh, fall and aeons and meta historical things and such like that, if you could say that the discussions of nature and essence. I guess, dependent on, you know, as we are now is one thing versus what we are in our, our key, what we will be in eternity, uh, not wanting to like fully put brackets on like, oh, we know what our essence is. And that that way we can, you know, uh, close off conversations and while you still want to have those conversations in certain practical aspects of, you know, this, the way we are now is not divine. And that has good reasons for that, but you wouldn't want to limit what human essence is because we're still becoming, we're still being made human. Um, mm -hmm. And even first John, I think three, two of, you know, we don't know yet what we shall be, but we'll be like Christ. Um, mm -hmm. And that's that Christ is the first true human. So, and even pre-existence comes into it there at the very end, which was actually mm -hmm. my original question of how does mm -hmm. Maximus then recover pre-existence within the Origenian discussion of it seems almost like it's a non-crude, non-temporal, mythical version of pre-existence, perhaps, that like if God can only become human because God already is human in a way that, you know, is beyond what we usually understand would that then work backwards kind of on the perichoretic sense where we don't pre-exist in a temporal way, but we do pre-exist in a eternal hypostatic way or something like that. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. So I don't think Maximus fully like, uh, you know, you're not going to find a development as clear as you do say in Eckhart about this sort of thing where he says, uh, there when I am standing in the cause, uh, in my own cause, I find myself to be my own cause, mm -hmm. that I am my own God. And, and in fact, God is no more for me. And the goal of the spiritual life is to have, is to, is to get rid of God. <laughs> so uh, very provocative stuff, but the point wouldn't be like some simple atheistic point. It's the, the point is that, um, if, uh, my truth is like who I truly am is, is, solely and only sourced in the one god then my return how that's how we characterize it from this perspective right now my return into god has to be not anywhere else but returning into actual god like he's the truth there's no, no other truth no other source of reality so a few things that you said though i think um i still think though that maximus has the resources for that kind of development um because he does reject the crude temporal sort of thing though 
admittedly, sometimes he's so focused on rebutting a certain aspect of it that it can sound, you can read it that way if you read it in isolation. But when you take texts into account, like some of the ones we've read today or like in um, uh, elsewhere where he says um, that there is no imprint of time or becoming on the incarnation. And then when you see that, uh, like, I have on one point he calls the flesh of Christ eternal. So, the, so there's a lot of like ways where, where you what, we, what you'd have to end up doing is say that the way in which we currently experience the process does not yet deliver the whole perfection of the process. So we tend to, but that's kind of where you have to start, and so you start just sort of projecting aspects of the process as the whole, and you try them out. The way, so crudely put, I'd say this. The way he recovers pre-existence is to say that the logos is your cause, but not ca but the causation of the logos doesn't function the way that normal the cascading sort of cause to effect to lower effect goes, because he is incarnate in all things. To follow Dionysius is you know Dionysius has the hierarchy. He coins the term. He's got the hierarchy of beings. But of course, the the most amazing thing about his discussion is that Jesus is also at the bottom of the hierarchy as human. So he's also the top and the bottom. He's the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. So if he is the way that we're caused, then the kind of causation we're talking about is exactly like with Dionysius. It's not insofar as he's conceived as caused to, of humans that he is human. It's insofar as he can become his own effect and remain the cause. That's a different sort of thing altogether. <laughs> you know, that's so wild. And so, pre, but that should have repercussions for the very way in which we conceptualize pre-existence the pre because what is this cause who is self-complete whose effects come after him and yet he's also one of the effects you know so so now the pre starts to get wrapped up into the post the pro the protos the protology actually becomes the eschatology hence maximus can actually up the ante you know you know origin always like to say the end is like the beginning he always says that in, in one first was like three or four times the end is like the beginning he uses the, I think he uses the word homios. Maximus says tav, tavtis. The end is the very same thing as the beginning. Identity once again. So that's like more extreme than origin. <laughs> yeah, how did he do that? So so that's the kind of paradox of it all. I think I'm, that I'm trying to get at Solomon. I don't know if this makes sense. Or not. Let me know. You could just when you jettison when you see when you see the whole act of creation through the act of the incarnation or as itself the extension of the incarnation then you start to undermine the logic of sequence that you were first grasping onto in order to make sense of everything both creation and incarnation as an event later and so forth but when you do that you start to wrap around and say uh not that we've just simply negated a possibility but a new positive and far more paradoxical and bizarre possibility starts to open up so that you can you know you can run across a letter where maximus says that the very same one existed both before and after his incarnation his before is his divinity and his after is his humanity it's like but the the thing that is after didn't come after him because it didn't exist except as him <laughs> so anyway it starts to like turn in on itself right so he preserves the pre-existence precisely by not absolutizing the very logic by which we said pre that's where i would go with that it's wild stuff and i don't always know you know part of this this it stands to reason that the reason should only be uh, on its own should only be able to point to it and that ultimately it's by experience that we'll know what it actually means but i get i get that that can be dangerous you know if it's purely fideistic I did have a question about epistemology that's not necessarily related to previous discussion, but I, I found his discussion in uh, about foreknowledge and sort of theoretical knowing and experiential knowing um, and their relation to be awesome. Very, very interesting. Um, and it, it put me in mind because I, I did a paper on this idea of divine foreknowledge the, the lecture that Alistair McIntyre gave that made waves at Notre Dame um, at one of their conferences that they have um, about divine foreknowledge. So I was just curious if you could maybe talk a little bit about Maximus' understanding of divine foreknowledge, possibly in reference or in context, especially of McIntyre's kind of take on divine foreknowledge. So uh, can you, I think I know what McIntyre said there, but it has been a while. So could you just quickly refresh me on that? 
Yes, yeah, so he he makes this 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 uh, controversial following uh, Peter Geach and and people like that who um, have this idea that like God doesn't have a foreknowledge in the way that we normally talk about foreknowledge. That there has to be some kind of surprise for God, or like God somehow self limits. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. It it, it basically introduces this the the concept of like open theism, um, right. and and so of course this caused a lot of controversy because people were like, yeah. well, is McIntyre coming out as an open theist at this point? Um, and <laughs> there, there's a pretty good, um, there, there's a couple of good re- response essays that were written um, that says, you know, well, no. And, and I, in the paper that I sort of wrote, I turned to Boethius who talks about different ways of knowing um, right in consolation of philosophy but in any case i'm just curious it do, does yeah. maximus have a particular understanding of um divine foreknowledge that would be relevant in in this respect okay so yes relevant i now i can't i can again similar to i think the last questions it's you know there's not going to be an extended development but really suggestive moments and aspects of his vision here's a few things i would note um well, just just quickly on the classical thing, I'm glad that you did on Boethius because you, you'll be familiar with this. So I've always I I've taught Boethius. Before. I love Boethius Consolations, one of my favorite texts, but I don't think he really gets us <laughs> um, to to where we to where the question and debate wants to go, and it's because it's it's almost you know. And the thing is, this exact same tension has recurred, as you know, many times throughout Christian history, not just Christian history. Um, the whole De Auxilis controversy between Jesuits and Dominicans and reading Thomas, it's going to replay all this in great detail, Molinism and all that. Um, Boethius's text has always struck me as like beautiful, but um, a little bit deflecting because he does the right denials. And this is the classic move, right? Well, God doesn't foreknow anything because number one, God isn't sort of bound in time so that the fore or pre or like looking ahead would make much sense. Okay. Uh, but does that mean God doesn't know anything? Certainly, especially like free acts, you know, acts that seem to not find their cause in God. Um, and and he's going to say, well, no, of course, God knows everything. It's a part of divinity to be uh, uh, omniscient, right? So you, he's not limited in knowledge. And if something's true, then he knows it. And he knows it perfectly. And he never doesn't know it. Already I'm using temporal language, but that's what we got. Um, but the example that he always struck me uh, gave was always seemed to me to just simply reinscribe the problem. So he says at one point, uh, as you know, like he says, um, you know, if you see a man walking, and even if it's simultaneous with the walking, the seeing and the walking, it's not as if the seeing causes the walking. Rather, the walking, it's almost like they're simultaneous and they're almost co-causing in different respects. Okay, well, of course, later Dominicans aren't going to have that because that still seems to mean that God's own knowledge is partially constituted by something that doesn't have its source in God. In other words, in the example, the walking man is just a given. But the deeper question with the divine foreknowledge stuff isn't, well, is seeing and walking, can they go together in one instant? Of course they can, even if you say it's an eternal now or an eternal undifferentiated moment of immediate knowledge, that simply postulates the very thing that needed to be explained, which was, why is it that the walking isn't determined by the knowing? And you just say, well, but if walking is there, then the knowing doesn't need to determine it. Sure, but it knows it as undetermined. So it just sort of it creates a circular sort of image. Uh, but it's a nice way to see what the problem really is, right? So the problem fundamentally is this. In what sense does God's eternal knowledge create the world? That's really the and especially when uh, agents that are free. And of course, some of us tend to then valorize the uh, the idea of libertarian freedom precisely because it seems like we're most the cause of ourselves when we choose something that opposes God's own will, hmm. right? So we're like, wow, that's when I'm really me is because I'm not being caused, you know? And so there's a whole problem there. But let's just sideline that for a second and just say, okay, so the problem is how is it that God's knowledge and his self-knowledge and knowledge of the world are somehow both 
totally perfect and also not determinative for those that need to become. Here's a few notes from Maximus's scattered that, and you're going to see some of this next week in Ambiguum 7. You're really going to want to think through the same question. You'll notice there that he, so he's, so everything is created in the logos and the, and, and the principles of all creation are called the logi, which is the plural of logos. Um, and he says that the one logos is the mini logi. And the, the mini Loki are the one Logos. Okay, so first of all, keeping in mind what we talked about today, the Logos is a person, not just a principle. He's the principle as person, as himself, by the way, not just the abstract concept of person. Um, and so the act of creation is the act of the Logos becoming the eminent principles of all things. So that's an act of incarnation, blah, blah, blah. That's where you're going to get the famous text about he wills always in all things to accomplish the mystery of his incarnation. Now, but what's so fascinating to me is like, um, you know, a lot of people have traditionally read Maximus as when he talks about the Logi as basically being like divine ideas or platonic forms or, or archetypes or something like that. Um, there's a little bit of justification to that, but the problem is Maximus never calls them any of that. Um, and in fact, when he cites Dionysius, who does use the term ideas and uh, or uh, paradigms, he doesn't use that. <laughs> Instead, he takes two other expressions of Dionysus in the exact same sentence. And he says, yeah, the Logi are, number one, divine wills, an act of willing. And number two, three, uh, it's like the, the, the literal clunky transition would be like predeterminations. But it's more like seeing the whole edge, all the edges at, at once kind of thing. Prefigurations is the way they usually translate. Okay. Now, that can sound like types or, or, or ideas, but the problem is, one, the Logos is the one who is them, and a person isn't reducible to form. But then number two, um, wills, right? It's not So it's not that he sees something come in his, his intellect and then wills it to be. It's that his very willing is the way he sees. See where I'm going with this? It's that I don't think there is an abstract... It's why there's been a perennial and a constant... Re returning to the same exact old debates throughout all of history, whether it's from Arminian, you know, Arminianism versus Calvinism, whether it's the Dioxilius controversy, whether it's these earlier ones, um, is and it's happened in other traditions too. Islamic tradition has a lot of this as well. Occasionalist first rate. Right? So it, I, I'm going to do the the sort of cheat move <laughs> and say um, what Maximus says about experiential knowledge in the text for today is also the truth of god's knowledge of creation but yeah, that, that knowledge yeah but that's a so it's not like the boetian seeing a guy walking over there see how the imagery is mm. dis, distinction and distance yeah though simultaneity of moment what i want to say is that for maximus the logic is perichoretic trinitarian interpenetrating love mm. so that it's just as true to say that the creation, ultimate creation of all, uh, all things, is God's experience of that creation and of Himself as that creation, as it is to say that it is something that God thinks up and then presses into existence in concrete form. That's too distant. That's too mechanistic. Still, that's still too detached. The truth is sort of the very whatever you want to call the divine experience. Father, Son, and Spirit is the very same love, which is also the logic and the experience, the happening mm -hmm. of not just, by the way, and this is going to be a nice segue into next week, not just of true eschatological, deified, absolute, accomplished creation, but precisely because it's interpersonal, even on the level of God and us as interpersonal. He also experiences and knows all of the false creation that we do cause through our misuse of freedom. And he takes that into himself, and ultimately that's called the passion. So that's not an abstract resolution, admittedly. But it does say, A, that the abstract resolution is futile and shouldn't be sought. And B, that doesn't mean that we can say nothing. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. I... It, it brings to mind also the specific examples that um, 
McIntyre gave yes. were, for instance, the precise details of a Shakespearean sonnet or the the precise content of Einstein's theory of relativity. Um, yeah, as instances of things that God could not know. Um, and that's sort of what's what sparked the controversy. But it seems that this would this would be the, those sorts of types of knowing would be a knowing of who or a pre, or an experiential knowing um, that is yeah. sort of unique to sort of hypostasis or perichoretic or, or perichoretic love, um, yeah. as opposed to sort of yeah the mechanistic abstract knowing of the future or knowing what. Right, because I, I just I have to say it. I know we're going way over, but y'all can drop out if you need to. But I'm going to go all day. Plus, I'm neglecting parental duties, so we'll, I'm doubly motivated. Um, so, <laughs> the whole controversy only works if you systematically exclude love and the Trinity from logic. In other words, just to put it in terms of today, if you already have conceded on the level of Christology that the incarnation is not actually the intrinsic, the revelation of the intrinsic logic of the whole God world relation, including eternity and time, well, then of course, yeah, yeah, all kinds of problems spring up and they are restive. They are impossible to resolve, in my opinion. No, I don't think I'm doing this to set up a magic category called the hypothesis to come in to save it. I think I'm just being honest about the actual history of thought. And it's that if you're going to go with the late Augustine, he has a point, right? And his point is when he's exegeting the story of Jacob and Esau, look, if God is affected by anything external to him, whether it's Jacob's, Jacob's righteousness or Esau's wickedness, and that that dictates the ultimate God's act uh, disposition and action towards them, then God's own knowledge and his action is dependent on something that's not him. So Augustine and Thomas Aquinas and, of course, Calvin and the more extreme, you know, they're all going to come down on that. And I think a lot of classical theists today basically come down to that on that side. And the thing is, they're not wrong. It's just that the truth that they hold isn't the whole. And what they're right about is nothing can be and be external to God. So you either take that all the way with Calvin, like, yeah, and so every every single tragedy is basically a result of God's will, or you can kind of make some room and decouple that a little bit, but still ultimately say something like, but look, you know, you know, ultimately God knows. It's not like he's surprised by anything or by a sonnet or by Einstein, whoever. Okay, so that's one side. And then the other side is those that want to valorize creativity, um, becoming, um, our identity as embodied creatures and so forth. And what they're going to say is, well, look, if, if God has to make room for that somehow, I have to genuinely and even spontaneously contribute to the whole here, or else I'm really just a cog in the machine or a puppet or something. And so they're going to, and so they're going to be willing to give up on some more classical attributes of God in order to make space conceptually, as it were, for this creativity to breathe. And so that's a McIntyre, what I think he's doing there. It also makes sense, right? He's it makes sense for an a primarily a, a philosophical ethicist to want to do that, right? For them, and especially one that's so influenced by Aristotelianism and Marxism, because he's going to say, "Look, this is what we know. We know we're free. We know there's injustice. We know, like, we know there's formation. We know virtue can be cultivated. We know all this stuff. We know what we contribute. We know the experience of beauty, which is something spontaneous. A, a spontaneous. Right? We know all that. So that makes sense that he wants to do that." Here's my point to all of that. They have a truth. It's just not the whole truth. <laughs> okay. And so what I want to notice is that the only reason why these two opposing sides and tendencies have been generated is precisely by circumscribing God in a concept like cause. As soon as you do that, you generate abstract oppositions. Sorry to sound dialectical, but that's what happens. You immediately think, well, if God is A, cause, then everything else is B, effect. Okay, well, what is a cause and what is an effect? Now you're formulating concepts. Mm -hmm. Well, you're never going to work back from that starting point. If, you, if you've already decided that because you had to start there, that must prescribe what, what, what can ultimately be said, you will never get back to bringing those two together in any coherent sense. And so you will always oscillate to either one side or the other. One will dominate. The, that's the only other way to make two things that oppose work is to hierarchize them. Which one are you going to 
prioritize privilege over the other. And so anyway, you, you know, you do that. And it, but the pro- what I think is so incredible about Christology is you don't have that option, in my opinion. Precise. And this is another thing I got against analogy is that it simply suspends all the questions. You cannot come to the point where you're standing at the foot of the cross and you see this man dying and say, he's the one who created the world. Through All through him, all things were made. And you can no longer think that it's adequate to say, yeah, you know, eternity and time. I don't know how those go together, but somehow maybe. Because the claim is they come together right here. And in him. So the fact that he is one subject, Cyril was right about that, is itself the thing that no longer makes it adequate to simply throw your hands up and say, yeah, somehow it goes together, I don't know, but here's my formal commitments. That's why I think this thing about the incarnation being the sort of revelation of the very intrinsic logic of the god will relation is so, uh, let's say, uh, primed to help to reconsider a whole host of otherwise um, uh, ir- you know, intractable debates or oscillations or back and forth. No, Maxwell doesn't have like a, I wish he had a treatise on divine foreknowledge. It'd be wonderful. But um, he doesn't, he didn't do even do what Proclus did about the eternity of the world. Although there's very interesting things in there. Next week, when you, when you, you probably already looked through uh, in Big M7, but I'd be interested to see what you think on the far side of that. You know, even independent of Christology, I've heard several Hasidic rabbis that would say that the, the real Jewish innovation was not monotheism which is kind of like anybody can get to through abstract thought. But the real Jewish innovation was that God, it was a revelation of God as a person. Yeah. And so then, right, because so that so you pair those concepts together, right? If you have, and this is sometimes what does happen in the classical tradition, God is first cause, but God is person. Well, how does that work? Right? Because, and, and so you will, well, you take the what? What do you do? You take the transcendence of the fir- status as first cause, and you couple it with the supposed freedom and caprice and creativity of a person. And so then you have a god who can sort of do whatever he wants or whatever. Like I'm not saying that's what I'm just saying that like this is the sort of problem that that then sets. So I think I agree with that. And then it and then it has like it raises all these questions. Okay, so so the whole god of the Bible versus the god of philosophers thing while way overdone and while i would no way take some kind of stance one way or the other in an abstract way about i think that's an abstraction uh, abstract opposition i still think there's not nothing there <laughs> right there's still the question is still how can god interact with me without simply being like separated from me and that's mostly what we do with rest content not you guys but like i've read a lot of people that rest content with like distance you know um oscillation the rhythms the back and f- like the sort of very airy images which are not bad in themselves but like the chasm where did the chasm come from who's sustaining that in being what's its source right so there's always that the rest of this sort of intractable thing but it's but you're right Nate. i think it's we want both that's the thing we want both we want everything i want god to be fully and completely love and not indifferent towards me in order to guard his transcendence but then i also don't want him to be merely imminent a merely imminent process and so how can he be both oh lo and behold there's a there's a doctrine about that <laughs> yeah so anyway well we've been flying guys would it be fair to say or in the realm of possibility that um christ is creating by the life that he's living like in history so I love I love that, and I love that you thought that I would guess part of that is from Ambiguum Five, uh, like just thinking about it, because I think it is that. I so there's a wonderful text in, in Mark uh, Four where uh, it's um it's like you know he feeds the four thousand or five thousand there, mm-hmm. multiplies the loaves and fish. He's done some other miracles, and there's a really interesting phrase. I, I remember saying this a long time ago, like 15, 16 years ago. Uh, it says something, I don't remember how they translated it, but something like he's making all things new or something. But it, but if you look at the Septuagint text, it's exactly from Genesis. Mm-hmm. And so, like, his act of the miracles are an act of creation, but like a primordial one. And now going to Maximus' world, his concepts and system, I would put it this way. 
One of the distinct innovations of Maxim, I don't know innovation, but yeah, a distinctive mark of his Christology is that even differentiates him from other people that were defending Chalcedon and stuff at his time, is that he's not really a a, a big partitive exegesis guy. And that means it means like, um, well, when Jesus is said to do some human thing, you say that's that's according to his humanity. You part partition it out and say. Oh, well, that's because he's human. Well, what about when he does something really amazing? Well, that's because he's God. So I'm partitioning the divinity part. And so you kind of have this reading where you're like, here he's doing a human thing. Here he's doing a God thing. <laughs> and this kind of goes back and forth, almost like uh, in succession. Maximus is very insistent that that's not how it is. Even his sufferings are divine action or you know, life-giving. And then even his divine actions are human. And what I want to say is, what is more divine than creation? So if his human create creaturely activity is inseparable in his actual person, and it interpenetrates his divine action, what are we talking about except that he's creating the world? Yeah. So yes, I. that's a long way of really just saying simply, yeah, I agree. And it's wild. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you thank you creation is incarnation so i've heard <laughs> is that your summation or is that a quote so it is my three word summation the quote uh you guys will read next week it's a perfect you know, uh, entree um next week in ambiguum 7 paragraph 22 where he says the word of god god himself wills always and in all things to actualize is the word you you won't see in that translation was actualize the mystery of his incarnation always and in all things so that is my summary is creation is incarnation you could simply flip it around as well though incarnation is creation right i mean that would be uh, the tough thing about a subtitle is that you have to write the words in a sequence and i don't like long titles so uh yeah but yeah that's my that would be my summation based from the quote in ambiguum 722 and then also mixed a little bit with the you know the whole mystery part of um well we've seen that twice now haven't we he says it in his trial the whole mystery and actually he he uses the word holy mysterio uh, holon which which is interesting because in the text today where it said whole mystery of christ it, it doesn't say whole it says the mystery according to christ but it's the same sense i think so yes paul yes and i assume you didn't say this but i assume that statement really gets to the nub of what many are are going to want to in some way say that cannot be Yes. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, right? And and, and as over the especially like next week or so, um, we can talk about that because it raises questions, right? Like, look, I was raised my whole life to 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 believe Christ is like the primacy of Christ, right? I mean, we're, it's um Christ is he he's not comparable. He's peerless. You can't, he's not just some sort of instance of a uh, of a, something that can be repeated all the time and like like it's ordinary. Um, I believe that that's the wrong understanding of primacy because it basically just means exceptionality. But it, but the the Hegelian point I would like to make, and I will claim because I may as well. I've already been tarred with all kinds of other things, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna own it. Something just being exceptional is not surprising at all. <laughs> so in a sense it's not really exceptional to be exceptional that just means it's an interruption in the series a pattern interruption in the pattern it's unexpected but the truly unexpected the fundamental exceptionality or primacy of christ is precisely that he doesn't have to be either particular so some capricious event that happened in history or simply universal some generic metaphysical principle in nature but that he is both at once. We have been soaring on this day. <laughs> I think I need an oxygen mask or something. <laughs> well, uh, 
I appreciate everybody hanging with us. This is this has been a long one. I enjoy it. I could go all day. I think a lot of you could too. Um, but yeah, next week we are. This is going to be very organic in terms of uh, it. Le- it leads to a discussion of what I call the dilemma of creation. Week three. And actually, some of the questions you guys already brought up, I mean, it's going to be great to revisit some of them, having read Ambiguum 7, and especially the intro to uh, question, or to um, questions to Thalassius. I think on the uh, outline that's on Canvas, I give you specific paragraph numbers for the intro, because you don't, it's not that all of the intro, not all the intro is relevant to what we're going to talk about. And actually, part of the intro we're going to read later, like the earlier part we're going to read later for a different topic, a different... So... Um, Check that out, but of course you can just read the whole thing if you want. I'm not going to stop you, but um, yeah. So um, we'll see uh, where the and I just I did want to say because some some have wondered. So if I if I wanted to key what we're going to talk about next week to something I've written, because I couldn't the next two weeks I couldn't really find text that I wanted to supplement. Like if you wanted to read more, it's basically the fourth chapter of of my book the whole mystery of christ i'm not saying that to try to sell it or whatever i'm just saying that that's the that is like the only direct treatment that i know of that i could supplementally throw out there uh, most other things i can have other texts other authors I'd, I'd rather assign other people but um when, when are we talking about that we should look at your text so for both next week um the week three uh and then also um week four just the next two weeks if anyone does want access to that and they just don't have it they, they can't afford it or anything like that totally fine just email me and i will hook you up i am not above that i just didn't want you to, to strong arm you to put in your book up so. <laughs> yeah well i can put some uh, one up that has some typos and stuff you know and and i hope everybody's you know. looking at because Jordan, you have the the course that you've put together in Canvas is so tight. I I think you've done such a wonderful job constructing the course, uh, and you're pointing us to the text, and you're man, you're you're putting this together, and the way that you've you've used utilized Canvas, you've put together a really neat package here. Well, thank you. And thanks for everybody for putting in the time. I know it's a lot of work. It's a big commitment. And I'm just thrilled there are people out there that want to, want to look at this stuff. So We had to go all over the world to get the people. <laughs> but, <laughs> but they're here. And they're eager, here. eager to talk about it. So, yeah, we sure appreciate it, Jordan, and appreciate your time. This has been wonderful. Yeah, of course. All right. See you guys next week. Thanks, thank Jordan. you. Thank you. Thanks, Jordan. Forging Plowshares is a community dedicated to cultivating the peaceful kingdom by providing in-depth, transformative biblical and theological education and discipleship. If you have found this podcast valuable, please remember to share on social media. If you have questions about what you've heard, or if you'd like to learn more about how you can get involved with Forging Plowshares, or even support this ministry financially, please visit our website, forgingplowshares.org.